Section 33 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perrard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 33. Essay on Walter Bajot by Forrest Morgan. Walter Bajot, 1826 to 1877. Walter Bajot was born February 3rd, 1826 at Langport, Somersetshire, England, and died there March 24th, 1877. He sprang on both sides from, and was reared in, a nest of wealthy bankers and ardent liberals, steeped in political history and with london country houses where leaders of thought and politics resorted and his mother's brother-in-law was dr pritchard the ethnologist this heredity progressive by disposition and conservative by trade and this entourage produced naturally enough a mind at once rapid of insight and cautious of judgment devoted almost equally to business action and intellectual speculation and on its speculative side turned toward the fields of political history and sociology but there were equally important elements not traceable his freshness of mental vision the strikingly novel points of view from which he looked at every subject was marvelous even in a century so fertile of varied independences he complained that quote, the most galling of yokes is the tyranny of your next-door neighbor unquote the obligation of thinking as he thinks. He had a keen, almost reckless wit and delicious, buoyant humor, whose utterances never pall by repetition. Few authors so abound in tenaciously quotable phrases and passages of humorous intellectuality. What is rarely found in connection with much humor, he had a sensitive dreaminess of nature, strongly poetic in feeling whence resulted a large appreciation of the subtler classes of poetry of which he was an acute and sympathizing critic as part of this temperament he had a strong bent toward mysticism in one essay he says flatly that mysticism is true which gave him a rare insight into the religious nature and some obscure problems of religious history though he was too cool scientific and humorous to be a great theologian Above all, he had that instinct of selective art in felicity of words and salience of ideas which elevates writing into literature, which long after a thought has merged its being and use in those of wider scope, keeps it in separate remembrance and retains for its creator his due of credit through the artistic charm of the shape he gave it. The result of a mixture of traits popularly thought incompatible and usually so in reality a great relish for the driest business facts and a creative literary gift was absolutely unique bajet explains the general sterility of literature as a guide to life by the fact that quote, so few people who can write know anything unquote, and began a reform in his own person by applying all his highest faculties, the best not only of his thought, but of his imagination and his literary skill, to the theme of his daily work, banking and business affairs and political economy. There have been many men of letters who were excellent businessmen and hard bargainers, sometimes, indeed, merchants or bankers, but they have held their literature as far as possible off the plane of their breadwinning. They have not used it to explain and decorate the latter, and made that the motive of art. Bajet loved business not alone as the born trader loves it, for its profit and its gratification of innate likings. Quote, business is really pleasanter than pleasure, though it does not look so, Unquote. he says in substance. But as an artist loves a picturesque situation, or a journalist a murder, it pleased his literary sense as material for analysis and composition he had in a high degree that union of the practical and the musing faculties 
which in its as yet highest degree made shakespeare but even shakespeare did not write dramas on how to make theatres pay or sonnets on real estate speculation Bagehot's career was determined as usual partly by character and partly by circumstances he graduated at london university in eighteen forty eight and studied for and was called to the bar but his father owned an interest in a rich old provincial bank and a good shipping business and instead of the law he joined in their conduct he had just before however passed a few months in france including the time of louis napoleon's coup d'etat in december eighteen fifty one and from paris he wrote to the london inquirer a unitarian weekly a remarkable series of letters on that event and its immediate sequence defending the usurpation vigorously and outlining his political creed from whose main lines he swerved but little in after life waiving the question whether the defence was valid and like all first-rate minds Bagehot is even more instructive when he is wrong than when he is right because the wrong is sure to be almost right and the truth on its side neglected the letters are full of fresh acute and even profound ideas sharp exposition of those primary objects of government which demagogues and buncombe legislators ignore racy wit sarcasm and description in one passage he rises for a moment into really blood-stirring rhetoric and proofs of his capacity thus early for reducing the confused cross-currents of daily life to the operation of great embracing laws no other writing of a youth of twenty-five on such subjects or almost none is worth remembering at all for its matter while this is perennially wholesome and educative as well as capital reading from this on he devoted most of his spare time to literature that he found so much spare time and produced so much of a high grade while winning respect as a business manager proves the excellent quality of his business brain he was one of the editors of the national review a very able and readable english quarterly from its foundation in eighteen fifty four to its death in eighteen sixty three and wrote for it twenty literary biographical and theological papers which are among his best titles to enduring remembrance and are full of his choicest flavors his wealth of thought fun poetic sensitiveness and deep religious feeling of the needs of human nature previous to this he had written some good articles for the prospective review and he wrote some afterwards for the fortnightly review including the series afterwards gathered into physics and politics and other periodicals but his chief industry and most peculiar work was determined by his marriage in eighteen fifty eight to the daughter of james wilson an ex-merchant who had founded the economist as a journal of trade banking and investment and made it prosperous and rather influential mr wilson was engaging in politics where he rose to high office and would probably have ended in the cabinet but being sent to india to regulate its finances died there in eighteen sixty Bagehot thereupon took control of the paper and was the paper until his death in eighteen seventy seven and the position he gave it was as unique as his own on banking finance taxation and political economy in general his utterances had such weight that chancellors of the exchequer consulted him as to the revenues and the london business world eagerly studied the paper for guidance but he went far beyond this and made it an unexampled force in politics and governmental science personal to himself for the first time a great political thinker applied his mind week by week to discussing the problems presented by passing politics and expounding the drift and meaning of current events in his nation and the others which were closest on it as france and america that he gained such a hearing was due not alone to his immense ability and to a style carefully modelled on the conversation of businessmen with each other but to his cool moderation and evident aloofness from party as party he dissected each like a man of science party was to him a tool and not a religion he jibed at the tories but the tories forgave him because he was half a tory at heart 
He utterly distrusted popular instincts and was afraid of popular ignorance. He was rarely warm for the actual measures of the liberals, but the liberals knew that he intensely despised the pig-headed obstructiveness of the typical Tory, and had no kinship with the blind worshippers of the status quo. To natives and foreigners alike, for many years, the paper was single and invaluable. In it, one could find, set forth acutely and dispassionately, the broad facts and the real purport of all great legislative proposals, free from the rant and mendacity, the fury and distortion, the prejudice and counter-prejudice of the party press. An outgrowth of his troubled position as banker, economic writer, and general literateur was his charming book, Lombard Street. Most writers know nothing about business, he sets forth. Most businessmen cannot write. Therefore, most writing about business is either unreadable or untrue. He put all his literary gifts at its service and produced a book as instructive as a trade manual and more delightful than most novels. Its luminous, easy, half-playful business talk is irresistibly captivating. It is a description and analysis of the London money market and its component parts, the Bank of England, the joint stock banks, the private banks, and the bill brokers. It will live, however, as literature and as a picture, not as a banker's guide, as the vividest outline of business London, of the great commerce and the fabric of credit which is the basis of modern civilization and of which London is the center that the world has ever known. Previous to this, the most widely known of his works, the English Constitution, much used as a textbook, has made a new epoch in political analysis and placed him among the foremost thinkers and writers of his time. Not only did it revolutionize the accepted mode of viewing that governmental structure, but as a treatise on government in general, its novel types of classification are now admitted commonplaces. Besides its main themes, the book is a great store of thought and suggestion on government, society, and human nature. For, as in all his works, he pours on his nominal subject a flood of illumination and analogy from the unlikeliest sources, and a piece of eminently pleasurable reading from end to end. Its basic novelty lay in what seems the most natural of inquiries, but which, in fact, was left for Bajot's original mind even to think of, the actual working of the governmental system in practice, as distinguished from legal theory. The result of this novel analysis was startling. Old powers and checks went to the rubbish heap, and a wholly new set of machinery and even new springs of force and life were substituted. He argued that the actual use of the English monarchy is not to do the work of government, but through its roots in the past, to gain popular loyalty and support for the real government, which the masses would not obey if they realize its genuine nature, that, quote, it raises the army, though it does not win the battle, unquote. He showed that the function of the House of Peers is not as a coordinate power with the commons, which is the real government, but as a revising body and an index of the strength of popular feeling. Constitutional governments, he divides into cabinet, where the people can change the government at any time, and therefore follow its acts and debates eagerly and instructedly, and presidential, where they can only change it at fixed terms, and are therefore apathetic and ill-formed and care little for speeches which can affect nothing. Just before Lombard Street came his scientific masterpiece, Physics and Politics, a work which does for human society what the origin of species does for organic life, expounding its method of progress from very low, if not the lowest forms, to higher ones. Indeed, one of its main lines is only a special application of Darwin's natural selection to societies, noting the survival of the strongest, which implies in the long run the best developed in all virtues that make for social cohesion, through conflict. But the book is so much more than that. 
in spite of its heavy debt to all scientific and institutional research, that it remains a first-rate feat of original, constructive thought. It is the more striking from its almost ludicrous brevity compared with the novelty, variety, and pregnancy of its ideas. It is scarcely more than a pamphlet. One can read it through in an evening. Yet there is hardly any book which is a master key to so many historical locks, so useful a standard for referring scattered sociological facts to so clarifying to the mind in the study of early history. The work is strewn with fertile and suggestive observations from many branches of knowledge. Its leading idea of the needs and difficulties of early societies is given in one of these citations. The unfinished economic studies are partially a resurvey of the same ground on a more limited scale, and contain, in addition, a mass of the nicest and shrewdest observations on modern trade and society, full of truth and suggestiveness. All the other books printed under his name are collections either from The Economist or from outside publications. As a thinker, Bajot's leading positions may be roughly summarized thus. In history, that reasoning from the present to the past is generally wrong and frequently nonsense. In politics, that abstract systems are foolish, that a government which does not benefit its subjects has no rights against one that will, that the masses had much better let the upper ranks do the governing than meddle with it themselves, that all classes are too eager to act without thinking and ought not to attempt so much. In society, that democracy is an evil because it leaves no specially trained upper class to furnish models for refinement. But there is vastly more besides this, and his value lies much more in the mental clarification afforded by his details than in the new principles of action afforded by his generalizations. He leaves men saner, soberer, juster, with a clearer sense of perspective, of real issues, that more than makes up for a slight diminution of zeal. As pure literature, the most individual trait in his writings sprang from his scorn of mere word-mongering divorce from actual life. Quote, a man ought to have the right of being a Philistine if he chooses, unquote, he tells us. Quote, there is a sickly incompleteness in men too fine for the world and too nice to work their way through it. Unquote. A great man of letters, no one has ever mocked his craft so persistently. A great thinker, he never tired of humorously magnifying the active and belittling the intellectual temperament. Of course, it was only half serious. He admits the force and utility of colossal visionaries like Shelley, constructive scholars like Gibbon, ascetic artists like Milton, even light dreamers like Hartley Coleridge. Indeed, intellectually, he appreciates all intellectual force and scorns feeble thought which has the effrontery to show itself, and those who are cross with the agony of a new idea. But his heart goes out to the unscholarly cavalier, with his dash and his loyalty, to the county member who hardly reads two books per existence, and even to the rustic who sticks to his old ideas and whom it takes seven weeks to comprehend an atom of a new one. A petty surface consistency must not be exacted from the miscellaneous utterances of a humorist. All sorts of complimentary half-truths are part of his service. His own quite just conception of humor, as meaning merely full vision and balanced judgment, is his best defense. When a man has attained the deep conception that there is such a thing as nonsense, he says, you may be sure of him forever after. At bottom he is thoroughly consistent, holding that the masses should work in contented deference to their intellectual guides, but those guides should qualify themselves by practical experience of life, that poetry is not an amusement for lazy sybarites, but the most elevating of spiritual influences, that religions cut the roots of their power by trying to avoid supernaturalism and cultivate intelligibility. 
and that the animal basis of human life is a screen expressly devised to shut off direct knowledge of god and make character possible to make his acquaintance first is to enter upon a store of high and fine enjoyment and of strong and vivifying thought which one must be either very rich of attainment or very feeble of grasp to find unprofitable or pleasureless end of section thirty three